All right, uh, welcome to Sugar Frosted Serial Podcast, discussing, reviewing, and theorizing about TV shows new and old, part of Next Level Nerd Network. I'm your host, Joe Gaffney, and my co-host, Justin McConnell, is here with me today. How are you doing, Justin? Excellent. Sweet. Um, <laughs> <it's> a- <laughs> Excellent. One word review. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. All right, so we're going to continue into the Westworld Season 2. Uh talking about episode two today just saw the other night and rewatched it again today the title, the title of which is reunion a reunion hopefully there's some reunions here with people coming back to this podcast mm, <laughs> i like that that's corny <laughs> but whatever very much so so uh, what was it in the f- opening scene man we just go right Right into the past, to that scene we've been seeing in the trailers with Dolores in the real world. Yeah, um, like in the now times. Yeah, which is like pretty crazy. <laughs> right. So like I was telling you, this this freaking episode, I have, I'm, I'm glad that, that you were able to watch it and, and help walk me through this because the first time I watched it, completely lost. Just... Tr- I, I spend a lot of time watching this show trying to put the timelines in order. Yeah. And I need to not do that because <laughs> it's it's weird because if you try to put it in order in your own head, it doesn't make as much sense. No, yeah, it really doesn't. <laughs> and I think that was like that was what I was saying uh last uh episode with how that's like our game. <laughs> yeah. That's the that's the audience's game. You know, it's a, it's a freaking Rubik's cube at this point. Yeah, that's our maze. That's our little maze that we got to figure out this little timeline debacle. Um, <laughs> I think this episode we really only experienced three timelines, to be specific, where you have the past, um, where we start off with Bernard, and then we kind of go through how Delos came to acquire. Um, Westworld, mm-hmm. and then we move until, let's say, we move a little bit forward in time to where, uh, what's it called, to William and his story and how he kind of takes over the park. Yeah. So that's probably like a year or two after the beginning of the episode. His beginning of the episode is even, you know, they just, it looks like they just got... The backing for the park. Right. Because Bernard is walking Dolores as actually he's Arnold. He's not Bernard. It's Arnold right. in the past. This is, this is the the flesh and blood yeah. Arnold. And he's, you know, kind of walking her around the city. And they're talking about, you know, them meeting, you know, potential backers for their project. And people are interested in. Um, so this was, this was one of the points where I got a little bit confused because at one point you hear somebody say, um, bring or use the other girl. And is that the blonde yeah. that shows up? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Because thinking back on that, I'm like, okay, I remember all this, but what was the point of the blonde girl? And then the blonde girl ends up going back and like sharing a scene with Dolores there for a second. Yeah, so you kind of have like a switching of the guard in a sense because, right? So that, almost, yeah, that host is like almost in charge, like she's like the lead, right? And then later on, it's like reversed in the quote unquote present, in the right. t- in the two week present leading up to the present present where Bernard's <laughs> on the beach, uh, <laughs> yeah, where Dolores is in charge and that girl's kind of like her secondary right so all right so let me get this straight so the the beginning of the episode like i said this one confused the hell out of me the beginning of the episode you've got uh Ber- or arnold talking to dolores i'm a screwed up there arnold is talking to dolores and it, it is he prepping her for the meeting with logan absolutely he, not okay <laughs> He doesn't give a shit about that, in my opinion. 
Like, so, he's just, he's trying to, like, I think that's the whole disconnect. That's where we start to see the disconnect, and we're given the glimpse of what that disconnect was, um, even before Arnold's, like, dead. You know, before he's killed by Dolores. As, right. As Wyatt, when he programs her that way. Right. And, you know... When he says that whole thing to her when they're on the balcony in her son, like his son's room, where mm-hmm. she's like, I'd like to meet your son, blah, 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 blah. And he's like, oh, you two are a lot alike. Um, she's his child. You know, he cares about her. Right. And I think that, like, because of that, she doesn't, or Arnold doesn't want her to be used in the way that the other hosts are used. Because she's not know. even present at the uh at the meeting where they like introduce uh Logan to right. all of the all of the hosts. Right. We get to see Clementines there playing the yeah. piano. But you're right. I, I, that's a that's a deep cut. You're right. That's his first that's his baby right there. Yeah, that's his first I think like his well, big breakthrough. Yeah. But it's also his like warning his first warning from from Ford, you know, right? You know, like it, there's going to be a point where you got to let go, or like yeah. F- Ford's kind of giving have, giving Arnold his first warning, like this Oof. is not what this is for, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, that's cold blooded. That kind of uh, takes me back to the the scene in um, the first season where you see. A young Anthony Hopkins, obviously digitally aged down, storming through the hall, yeah. going to Arnold's office to chew his ass for, you know, doing stuff he's not supposed to be doing. Yeah, because he's still uh, Arnold. Arnold is a pro- procrastinator. Like, mm-hmm. I I think you can see that in the fact that his house isn't finished yet. Yeah, that he's kind of procrastinated to move his family to where he works or or right. close by. He's procrastinated with. Dolores and in kind of like fully realizing her right. and you know he's procrastinated even after that when that whole argument goes down in the first mm-hmm. season where he's like the park's not ready and Anthony mm-hmm. Hopkins is like yeah well <laughs> it needs to be <laughs> yeah <laughs> like too freaking shit bad together. yeah too freaking bad yeah you know because I think from from Dr. Ford's uh, perspective where I think you kind of have like the two gods at play. Right. Because you have the god Arnold, who's the loving god, who wants to teach his children the right way. And then you have the overbearing, like, authoritarian god in Dr. Ford, who's like, no, you do what I say, and what I say is law, and you always obey me. You know, yeah, kind there's of thing. a little bit of a there's a little bit of a um, paradise lost yeah kind of aspect to it where it's like Lucifer, you know, and and God and yeah that that's wow I hadn't thought of that. This show is ridiculously smart and sometimes I think it's too smart for me. <laughs> um, either that or I'm just really dumb. We'll work through it. We'll work through it. Okay. This ep- this episode was like, you know, you're saying like it's a little confusing. I think this episode was a lot more straightforward. Um and that's that was like its trick. It was right. really just supposed to show us the past and what happened in the past and what led to the present. And there's not a lot of like I think they try and trick us with a little bit of use of repeating dialogue, you know, the whole, have you seen anything so full of splendor? I think that was more a call to the glitch that is inherently wrong with Dolores. Right. That's her phrase. And that like, that's her cornerstone, I think in a way. And I think this episode, you know, just based off of what you and I had talked about before, I I feel like this episode kind of trapped me into maybe, making me think it was smarter than it actually was because seriously, I felt like it was, you know, 1989 and I'm breaking out the graph paper to draw out the maps for Zelda, you know, trying to figure this shit out as to what's going on and everything. And I think it was just a more, a more straightforward episode. The more we talk about it. Yeah. But yeah, the timelines, I can't get past that. 
Yeah, it really <laughs> it really sinks into me though about the cornerstone thing. I think that was the deepest thing this episode was yeah. the cornerstone because when in the first season when Robert Ford and Bernard are talking about cornerstones and Bernard's talking about you know cornerstones and how tragedy is like the best cornerstone, we have to realize that Dolores doesn't have a cornerstone. There's no tragedy. Right. There's no tragedy in her life. There's no cornerstone that backs her up. She hmm. doesn't have a cornerstone like all the other characters yeah. do. They all have like something bad that happens to them. Where it's like Dolores' only cornerstone is a real cornerstone. Hmm. When she kills Arnold, that's her cornerstone. That's genius. Um, <laughs> and I think like without that you kind of have that her always falling back on her original cornerstone is that childlike wonderment that Arnold programmed in her to begin with but then he realizes on the the balcony when he's in his son's room and he's like talking to her or what's going to be his son's room Mm -hmm. and she just repeats the line again when she said it not more than 15 minutes ago or whatever lapsed time in the same Scene, right, right. You know, when she's looking at all the lights and everything. Yeah. Hmm. So he he realizes that right then that she's, mm-hmm. you know, he wants to keep that wonderment in her. He wants her to be a child, but at the same time, like, he like he's not ready to go. Like he's like he's not ready to let her go and be on her own. And, mm-hmm. and it's that whole like, you know, your child can't like you know until your child kind of like feels in control and makes their own decisions, they're not, you know, going to make good decisions unless they've been through hardships. And I think that's, that goes back to the whole pathways thing. Um, in the, in the first episode where Arnold is talking to Dolores in the past where he says, you know, you scare me. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, because of blah, blah, blah. And then, he references because I'm afraid what path you're going to take. And that's a right. very like parental thing. <laughs> yeah, definitely. It's yeah. Ooh. <laughs> you definitely went way deeper on this one than I did, <laughs> which I mean, I'm glad, I'm glad for that, but, uh, yeah. So, after after the uh, after the whole scene with um, between uh, Arnold and and Dolores, where does it where do we cut to from there? Oh man, we have that stark contrast of her in the present in the two right. in the two week present, right? <laughs> um, and this is when and it's immediately opposite where she's done. She's done with the splendor. She's like, I've yeah. seen what the world has to offer. Like, it's not pretty anymore. And it's kind of like everything Arnold had feared would happen. Yeah, shine's worn off. Yeah, she's lost. She's lost that naivete, and uh, she's pretty pissed off at the way things have turned out for her. Yeah, and the way she's been treated. Hell hath no fury, like yeah. a female robot scorned. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, yeah. And there's a, like they torture that one guy to figure out like you know what's gonna happen, and like all the guards are so, She she shows Teddy like all his deaths. Yeah, um, and that was like pretty fucking cold. Yeah, it was. Like you can kind of like she's not even phased by it, and. No. Um, She's she's not she's not helping Teddy along. She's basically dragging his ass down the path. Like he's he's essentially gone from being the the good guy, the white hat, you know, in in their lingo to being like this really conflicted almost like a slave to her desire. Yeah. Um not like in a sexual way obviously, but like in a in a, um, I mean, he loves her. Um, like it's, he's programmed to love her. He is. Yeah. And I, I think there's a part of that that's actually real. Yeah. You know? But she's just so full of hatred and vengeance. It's like, at what point is, is he, do you think he's ever going to, like, go against her? Or do you think he's just a blind follower? Because he is relying so much on that programming. 
Man, that's a hard one because we get that story later on, and I don't yeah. want to I don't want to get to it too soon. But I mean, it does. I think it does correlate to this, and the fact that you know, even she says, you know, not everyone's going to make it to to glory, or mm-hmm. you know, um, and that that's that whole elephant story where like you know, they're kind of yeah. trained to be like pinned down. And they don't know anything else, so how can they make a decision? You know, now they're now they're giants. They have like they're in control. They have everything. They could do anything they want and and overthrow because they have so right. much power and knowledge or whatever. They could overthrow their their masters completely. But they are elephants that were you know held down by a stake, and yeah. they might never outgrow that. And I think it's something that Dolores realizes. Um, and how much that comes to pass and how true that is, um, that's going to be, yeah, it's going to be a big thing. I don't know. I think I'd like Teddy to overcome that part of him. And, and if he's the one who like, kind of like ends her. Yeah. He's almost, um, he's almost not, not fully realized yet though. Like he, yeah. you know, he. He's not a, um, you know, he has no sense of autonomy. He's just, you know, he's, I see him and I still see a host, yeah. you know, with, with Dolores, you're seeing somebody who is, is getting, um, you know, trying to fight for their dignity and, and, uh, individuality. Whereas Teddy's just like, like just slow. He yeah. just, he's not getting it yet. And I feel like she's pulling him towards that, and he's picking up on it a little bit. But I think he also – he has a strong moral center just based on his programming. So I think that – I'm kind of thinking – wondering if there's going to be a conflict there. Yeah, because like – oh, I think there definitely is. I think, uh, you know, he – he – um Man, he's like he's on that ridge, and like you know, we talking about we're gonna be free, and like all I've seen, like since here and wherever is like, you know, blood and death or whatever that he says when they're mm-hmm. on the ridge in the first episode, and then like this second episode, like it just it's a continuation of the same thing. He's realizing who he is, and that he's like, you know, a host, mm-hmm. whatever whatever he can understand about that, um, and then realizing you know human you know blah 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 that he's like versus them but at the same time like is it right to kill right because he talks about when Maeve kind of like comes up on them you know I'm just trying to keep the peace or you know do what's right and Maeve kind of gives him this whole kind of little thing because they won't let her pass where Dolores is talking about like setting everybody free, you know, and that's like mm-hmm. the true fight is is the liberation to be liberated and stuff like that. Yeah, and she, you know, Teddy's like, yeah, like, I'm just trying to keep the peace, and she's like, oh, I remember you, you know. It's like, do you are you really free? And yeah. I think that really fucking that really cuts him. Yeah, that grinds his gears right there. That be, sticks him where be, it counts. Yeah, because he realizes like maybe I'm not kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And we get that little that little tidbit of Lee Sizemore. <laughs> yeah. And that little outfit. <laughs> it looks like a, <laughs> It looks so ridiculous. It's great. <laughs> oh man. Oh, it's a beautiful shot. <laughs> I just love it so much. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. So we roll on rolling on from from that we is this where we first see the man in black um cut to his story yeah i don't know if you want to do it that way or you want to like keep going with the, with dolores and all, like all her kind of gang <clears throat> yeah because it's a very the episode's very focused on those two characters yeah um kind of past present and future you know, and just yeah, let's do let's go with the whole Dolores storyline first, and then look at look at the Man in Black storyline second, I guess. Yeah, because she's trying to build her army 
Um, she run into, she runs into Maeve, and we didn't really get to talk about Maeve in the first podcast, so I think at the end we should we should loop back around to that. Um, yeah. But she's trying to build her army because she realizes that like a ton of people are going to come and try and stop them. Um, and they're not going to talk about Maeve right now, but one thing we I would say about Maeve at this moment, she's the only one who's free. Right. She is liberated, which is why she doesn't care. She realizes that nobody else is liberated. Yeah. So Ma- Maeve already has either been to where the weapon is or... I, yeah, but I'm she's trying to. St- she's also dialed up to eleven because you know yeah. you remember the first season she went through and just put like her sympathy is like a zero and like all her attributes are like through the roof and you know the character of Maeve I really I like but the actress that plays her and I know you, I'm probably gonna get shit on for this but there there's so many. Like, the way she delivers the lines is so, like, mustache-twirling villain sometimes <laughs> that it just drives me freaking nuts when she's all like, oh, darling, and darling, and da-, and I'm like, just stop with that shit. Like, come on. It's, it's I think still- it's actually, uh, I actually, I mean, I like it. I like the character. I love, I like I love character. her character. I and like I honestly character. think that a lot of that has to do with the fact that going back to the first season and being like, lose the accent. Yeah. Everybody still uses their accent. Yeah. And it's she, because they can't, they're not like fully over their programming. Right. And she, I don't know. There's something about, there's something about her where she's just like this. She's not a one note character by any sense of the term, but she just, she, she, she lives to deliver the one liners, you know, yeah. and it's like, come on, give somebody else a turn. And <laughs> she, she almost reminds me of like when, when you watch a Quentin Tarantino movie and a particular character has a cheesy line of dialogue, you know, I mean, Tarantino is good at writing dialogue, but every now and then he'll have a cheese moment. And, it seems like every time Maeve's on screen, it's like the worst parts of Quentin Tarantino's writing. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, on the other hand, the character is really cool. You yeah, know? I think that that's like the character's written that way. I think that's yeah. also funny be- that you say that because, like, I think she's. I think the actress does a really good job of continuing to stay in that kind of, like, character. Right. Um,. And you have to remember who programmed her. Yeah. The doofiest of doofs. <laughs> yeah. Lee Sizemore. <laughs> you know, like, I think, like, you know, he's the one who programmed her to talk like that. Right. So it's like, I feel like, I almost feel like in a way, like, you can't even, you can't even be mad at the character in sort of like a meta way. You have to be right. mad at Lee Sizemore. And see, that's the thing, <laughs> is like, I'm so conflicted with this character. Like, I I don't know what it is. Like, it's it's I, it's just something I can't put my thumb on. I just can't 100% say I like or hate this character. I think because she's not really... she had, she's, she's one of the few characters who you don't really know. She doesn't have a side. Um, yeah, she's kind of she's kind her of, side is herself. Yeah, and she's kind of out there, and you and you root for her in a sense that like you know she cares about her daughter and she wants to find her daughter, but in a sense like you don't care about that because you realize from a meta standpoint that like her daughter really isn't her daughter and it's not real and she's still being she's still programmed, and it goes right. back to that thing I think I said uh, last episode where like her getting off of the train. Like, is that just part of another narrative that Ford wrote for her to, like, kind of carry out? Because, like, yeah. Bernard's, like, reading her, like, the whole blah, 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 you know, are you sure you're doing this to your own volition, building an army and all this shit like that? Mm-hmm. And now I think, like, she did all that and she overthrew everything and she came back. And I think now she's doing what she wants to do to a degree. She is free. She's liberated. 
her getting off the train I don't think was like of her own volition because like she had to finish like the whole army thing. Right. But her going now, after her daughter is a rejection of I See think, and the, uh, I started to wonder if the whole the whole going after the daughter thing isn't a way to keep to keep her in check, you know, like a fail safe. Yeah, you know, I mean, true. obviously this is written by Michael Crichton, you know, initially the Westworld story was. And, you know, the fail safe for the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park, which is a very similar story, was, you know, they were all female and they uh, were – you know, given hormone therapy to make sure that they stayed female. And, you know, there was a, um, uh, oh shit. What was the contingency plan? If they, um, if they weren't given a certain protein or something like that, they all went into a coma and died. Yeah. And the, it was like lysine or something. I can't remember. Yeah. But anyways, and you, you were mentioning that before. Uh, continue. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm just – I'm wondering if there's not some sort of fail-safe built into these things. Like if they go completely off the rails, there's got to be something that brings them back, you know? And, I mean, obviously not every one of the characters has a daughter that they're worried about, but they are tied to other things. You know, for a long time, Dolores was tied to her father, you know, and we saw what happened when he died. And she's also tied to Teddy – and, you know, she was tied to William, you know, she had this strong sense of attachment. And I wonder if those strong sense of it, that strong sense of attachment isn't built into the hosts in different ways. Two other characters. Right. Yeah. I don't know. No, it's a, it's a really, it's, I think it's a good point. Uh, and I think, I think you're right. It could be, it could be a fail safe that that's drawing her back so that she doesn't leave. Um, aside from like her getting the, her new body and, you know, they have that device, you know, that they have in their spines and, you know, and they're dead, <laughs> you know, they yeah. Kind of, um, yeah. The programming itself can be a way of like bringing them back. Um, yeah. and to talk about like the enzyme or whatever, um, I was talking to a friend of mine who was saying that he thinks like that that's like like that's what happens to every all the hosts mm -hmm. like at the end of that one episode and why Bernard like injected that stuff into his brain like that's mm -hmm. the enzyme that's why he's having a fit, you know critical failure because he doesn't have any of that, enough of that enzyme yeah so when he starts leaking out the ear or whatever yeah. Um, so that's like, a, I think that's like, I think that's a strong possibility, especially like a holdover from the like original movie, a little like Easter egg sort of thing to pay homage to the, to the original movies. Yeah. Um, although I don't think that's why the hosts are all down. I think that, that I, don't... I think that that has to do with the weapon. I think that might even have to do with, um, when what's her name, when Maeve got her new body. You know, she disposed of her body. Mm hmm But, you know, if that weapon is, like, the freedom from the park, then, well, then they're going to have to, like, get rid of all their bodies and kind of, like, either get, like, uploaded into new bodies. Right. And we did see, <laughs> I'm sure you've seen it, and I, I know you're trying to avoid the uh, next week on Westworld or whatever, but in the trailers and everything, we have seen Maeve wielding a samurai sword yeah. and, you know, uh, dressed like a, um, you know, dressed like she's in the samurai world. And I've even heard some things about how they were going to explore that world a little bit more, which is just another park, um, as a part of Westworld or Del or Delos, um, owned theme park, like, like Westworld. Um, so, Maybe that's the key between worlds or something. That yeah. weapon that you were referring to, I don't know. Uh, well, and then, well, I think that that place or that weapon has to do with the whole scene where William um, and Dolores are in the past, and he's showing her, and he says the line to her, like, "Have you ever seen anything?" Um, 
seen some so much splendor yeah and it's like the two things like digging up the ground and it kind of looks like the place where dolores was kind of digging up and they they were like the host of the host like make this like ocean when they find all their bodies you know kind of thing because it wasn't there before it's not on the maps so you know there's that possibility i think that that might be a connection um lost my train of thought Okay, Damien. Yeah, I lost it. <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying when the excavators were were like, or whatever they were, the construction equipment was like, yeah, that's the place. digging out. That's that... where the weapon okay. is. Yeah, kind of thing. That's okay. What I'm kind of thinking. And I'm wondering, like, that. I mean, that whole thing. I mean, people are going to be speculating on that until, it, you know, at the very least next week. Uh, hopefully we get the answer to what the weapon is, but you know, is that like, is that a, is it a physical place? Is it a physical weapon? Is it coding? Is it, you know, what exactly are they digging for? Well, yeah. I mean, I hope we get that soon. I mean, I think they're actually gonna, I think they're gonna drag that one out. <laughs> yeah. Um, cause you have James Delos that, you know, we get introduced to Logan's father, um, in that scene where he comes and checks everything out and then Will has to kind of prove to him that the park's like worth continuing investing in it because I think we get we get the sense if not from that scene but the next scene that we see him in that he's he's not long for this world and he's actually sick yeah um, and Will feeds him in my opinion a bullshit line about uh, spying on the guests and re- and like you know spend all this money on marketing blah 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 Facebook uh, Mark Zuckerberg spy on everybody right. we'll tell them we're not but we really are so we can so we can use the information to know what they really want to buy and what they really want right. I think I think that's low shit I think that was that was the line to get him interested in continuing to do it. That was but his that's, sales pitch. That was a sales pitch, but you know, and that was a great like we see we see who the man in black almost like we, we've seen Will become the man in black in the park where he kills mm-hmm. all the hosts and he gets that edge to him. But I think like his like idol that kind of becomes his idols, we get this scene where he's like talking to James Delos and he says, Well, if you know that doesn't interest you you're not the salesman I thought you were. You're not the businessman I thought you were. And then mm-hmm. we get that line that we've heard the man in black say, you know, there's not a man alive who would dare talk to me uh, that way, you know, that's alive, right. like, anymore. Yeah. And um, such a great, like, <laughs> like, that's who, like. You see you see the, the strings in the marionette a little bit. Yeah. And I think, I mean, like. Um, I think there's going to be some duality there with, with that story line with, with James Delos, where we get to see what he's really after and how that corresponds to what Will's really after. Right. And what he really sees the park as, you know, he sees it as the future, but like what future is that? And he doesn't care about the information. And when we go to the, the future, in the past two weeks where we go to the man in black and he starts talking. I'm kind of skipping around here. I'm sorry. That's fine. (laughs) He's talking to Lawrence He meets back up with Lawrence and he starts talking about how, you know, you know, God and there is no God and the stuff like, you know, the Robert Ford program, I believe in God and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And he starts talking about what, what he's really after and how he refers to like the weapon in his own mm-hmm. way, um, and the truth and the real ending that he says, and um, treasure beyond your wildest dreams, glory, right? You know all those references to the weapon, right? I I think those are all references to the weapon. Yeah, I mean, and that's the thing is, you know, with. 
with the whole story, the way things are going, it's almost, to me, it seems like the weapon is going to be something that gives the the holder of the weapon is going to have either complete control of this world inside the real world or the world as a whole, you know, where, where, you know, if Dolores gets the weapon, she'll be able to use it to break free from bondage and, you know, basically become the dominant species. Whereas if the man in black gets it, you know, going back to my theory that ultimately he turns out to be, the hero who stops the yeah, rising because he talks about know. how he wants to like get to the get to the doorway right and then just burn the place to the ground yeah and so see, in a way I, then he's the hero yeah you're right exactly exactly and i think i think you know he's almost i, I think the big i don't think it's necessarily going to be a huge twist but in terms of perspective you know everybody's the hero of their own story. Yeah. When you look at the man in black, he's the hero saving the world from a robot uprising. When you look at Dolores, she's the hero stopping the persecution of sentient beings. You know, so I I could see, you know, either way, either way, whoever wins, you know, unless it's, stupid like the matrix revolutions and we get a peace time between you know ai and uh humanity you know I, I think either way we're in for you know quite the struggle yeah i mean i have a theory <laughs> i don't know if we want to save like theories for the end of it i think we're actually almost i think we pretty much hit on most of the things through the episode most of the big stuff yeah we didn't talk about the confederales but they don't really it's really just dolores kind of showing them what they really are by killing them and then bringing them back right um we do have that awesome moment with el lazo played by giancarlo this looks like a cameo uh giancarlo's from uh from breaking bad which is a really cool uh cameo for him to play uh el razo um and you know that whole thing where i think even as soon as he kind of shows up in a way i think he's just he's a robert ford character if he's not if he's not completely programmed by robert ford and speaking as if he were robert ford or, or you know robert ford is speaking through him like I'd be really surprised because even though the real obvious line at the end where it's like, you know, this game is meant for just you Mm -hmm. and then he kills himself or whatever. I think even the speech about the elephant and that story, which I think is a reference to like the hosts that they won't be able to escape what they've been programmed to do. They won't be able to overcome that programming that's tethered them down. I think that's, that's Robert Ford, you know, that's, that's Dr. Ford speaking through him. And then, you know, even a line about like, you know, you know, nothing else but drinking to the bitter end. Right. So like, you know, like, like the story's not going to have a happy ending kind of thing. Right. (laughs) Or are we in agreement that in some way, whether it's physical or, uh, if it's artificial intelligence, that Robert Ford has found a way to keep himself immortal. Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Because I'm seeing there's a lot of you know there's a lot of plates spinning right now, you know, and I'm seeing basically the 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 way Ford uh, has been written and is kind of. Um, it's st- you still see his hand, uh, you know, the the um, invisible hand working in mysterious ways here. And, you know, his death almost seems like, you know, if you go back and watch that in season one, he knew it was coming. You know, yeah. he's just like, all right, peace out. You know, you think you can stop me, but you can't, you know. And the closest thing I can equate that to is... uh 
uh, follow me here real quick. I'm going to nerd out. Arnim Zola in, uh, or Zola in uh, Captain America. He is the uh, Johann Schmidt, the Red Skull's buddy that puts himself into the AI. Okay. And yeah, yeah, yeah. In Winter Soldier, he's the computer that they find. Mm-hmm. Anyways, you know, seeing him say, okay, well, I'm going to put my, essentially put my brain into the code. You know, put it in, make myself almost like... He makes himself uh, an immortal god like he already kind of believes he is. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, Yeah, sorry. I stumbled to get there, but you helped me along. (laughs) No, I mean, I think we're we're definitely on the same page with that. I mean, we mentioned that last episode, and I even posited that episode that I thought he was still alive because of the whole, yeah. like, he was making that other body. Who is that other body that he was making? And I was like, he's he he made the assassination, du- you know, duplicator thing. So either he's still alive right. or he's, like, obviously, you know, like what you said, which I think, I think that might, I think there's a strong probability of that in the way that he's been kind of showing up. Right. Throughout the... He- he broke the through in the he broke through in the little boy in the last episode and was talking to William, man in yeah. black, old William, and like you he, know, and he knows exactly where he is, right? And <laughs> you know, he triggers the the gang to all kill themselves. Yeah, you know. So I, I'm thinking like I, I'm starting to think he put his consciousness. That's the word I'm looking for. Put his consciousness into the either the the mesh network that they talked about before or something like that where he is almost like ultron to use another marvel yeah (laughs) uh, sorry i just saw infinity war to use another uh you know analog he's kind of it doesn't matter what you do to the body the consciousness lives on and he's spreading like a computer virus well yeah definitely and i think that that that's a good segue into my big theory that mm. I have, which is the the replacement theory. I don't know if I, it's not a good name, whatever. But basically, that I think Delos's whole plan from the beginning was to be able to replace people, as we talked mm. about last episode, where Bernardold. <laughs> Because that's like he is literally Bernardo because he has his right. DNA. He's able to get through the door, right? Which means that hosts have DNA, and we all we talked about before how like the flies hover around them and they do decompose in some way. They have some semblance of real blood and flesh, right. um, even to like you know within like a two inch layer, like all of their organs and stuff like that are made to look real. Uh Um, even like internally and they can only, you know, they have like a certain limit of like blood that before like shuts them off. So that kind of pays credence to the whole thing where he's like injecting himself with that fluid. So that is obviously in their blood as well and not just in their brain. Um, whether the blood is just a fail safe to like, you shoot them and they die kind of Yeah. Or it's like that's part of like them losing the liquid. So they shut down. So they don't have enough to like run off of whatever fuel that that is. Yeah. Um, but, uh, what's it called? But yeah. So like the whole, like tracing the DNA and then gathering information, I think the gathering information and seeing who people really are in their deepest, darkest thoughts is like really a way to, find out who a person really is, you know, top to bottom, inside and out, they, they, you know, they can get their DNA, you know, they mm-hmm. have all the measurements from them. Right. You know what I mean? When they go to the park, they give all that information away freely because, the, you know, when they're changing in the changing room, all the clothes fits them. And well, not to mention and the they, amount of sex that goes on at the brothel. Yeah, so they get their DNA <laughs> and everything like that. They, they see how they act and this, that, and the other in their deepest selves, and then, you know, you program a replacement. Yeah. And, and, you know, what if they're, like, killing people, and then when those people go out, that's not a person. 
Yeah. That's a replacement. Phew. <laughs> the show just got darker. <laughs> You know what I mean? What if that's like, what if that's the real weapon? And, and when all the hosts die in that one scene that we see, they're all like dead or whatever. Who's to say they don't steal all that DNA and become somebody else? Well, you know, become think, somebody that can leave the park. I think a good way to reveal that theory, if that does end up being true, would be to have Logan show up as, because at the end of the first season, we see him basically. He rides off on a horse. Yeah. And we never see him again. Oh, we see him in this episode. We see him in this episode, but this is in the past. I think it... No, because it's definitely... That scene where we see him, it's definitely... That whole retirement party... It's not necessarily a retirement party, but it's basically... um, James Delos passing the, the mantle to William. Right. And... That is, I think that's post Westworld. Oh uh, yeah, scene. yeah, Because yeah, then right. he's like upset about, it, and that's why he's like, you know, doing future drugs and all that kind of shit that he's doing. I so. love future <laughs> drugs. Um, what? Uh, so, so there is a missing gap there for Logan as to what happened between the end of his story in the first season in the young timeline, yeah, and this season at the quote-unquote coronation of William scene where him and Dolores have the conversation and he's doing future heroin. Yeah, I mean, I think you get the sense that he disappointed his father. Yeah. Um, in some sense. And I don't know, like, whether he kind of, like, came back hysterical and was like, oh, William was this, that, and the other, and William came back and was like, dude, it's just a game. Yeah. And sort of, like, played it out, like, psychologically, like, you don't, like, he, your son is obviously not right from this, you know, you shouldn't let him right. lead. Because he obviously yeah. doesn't think with anything but his pecker. Yeah. <laughs> you know, kind of thing. So, huh. and that's my thought. But, yeah, you're right. We haven't really gotten a good sense of... Like, we can speculate, but we haven't gotten a true sense of, like, what happened. Whether they're going to do that or whether that's even important, I don't know. Right. I don't know if that's really important. I mean, if he plays a bigger part, I mean, he did come back this year. Yeah. Which I think is saying something about his character. But, yeah, I don't know. It's going to be interesting. Because he is kind of the only character in the past that kind of, like, sees this all coming to fruition. Right. He's the, I mean, he is like the kind of the brains behind, we need to finance this, this operation. We need to back this. But yeah, there's, I think there's for the, the actor, um, I forget his name. Um, um, I keep wanting to say Billy Russo, but that's because he was on the Punisher (laughs) as Jigsaw. But, um, for, for an actor of that level, um, you know, I don't think they would waste that actor, you know? I mean... Yeah, he do, he does do a really good job of playing the character that he is, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like he, he, He's a snot-nosed little spoiled brat, yeah. pain-in-the-ass rich kid. But he plays it well. <laughs> he does play it really well. Um, but... I mean, there's a lot of good uh, actors and actresses on this show that kind of, like, don't have, like, major major parts because right. um, you have like Hector's character um, and he's a really famous well known um, Brazilian actor he played Xerxes in 300 no way yeah that's him <laughs> I, I did not catch that well, um, it must be the voice yeah and then he was like he was on Lost and he was actually a pretty popular character on Lost he didn't last long but like the story of him and the, I think it's just like a girlfriend or a character on the show or whatever. It was like a pretty interesting story and gave a lot of like hints to what was going on in that story, but regardless. <laughs> um, but yeah, so he's like a really good, you know, actor and he's kind of playing like a, a side, right. uh, character. Yeah. Well, do we have anything else to add? 
I think that's kind of it, unless you have your own theories, and we're just going to continue with the fly theory. <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm. I, it's so hard to tell though, because I think this show is. It, you know, the first season. I watched the first season, going, "What the hell is going on here?" And about you know halfway through. Or no, there was about ten episodes. About episode eight, I started to pick up on what the hell was going on. Yeah. This season, I'm like, okay, and you know, I'm trying to piece things together, um, you know, but it, it's not quite making a hundred percent sense. And I think that we're we're entering an age now where TV. Um, especially short series like this that are just 10 episodes um, shows like Game of Thrones uh, you know the Netflix Marvel shows those kind of things are becoming more and more rewatchable you know we've kind of gone away from the 24 episode seasons and stuff to where we can have these shorter seasons of better content yeah and I think that's what what Westworld season two is gonna end up being is you're watching it going, I don't know what the hell's going on. And then you watch the last episode and go, holy shit, let's start it over. <laughs> you know, like I think the story as a whole is, is more engaging for the viewer now in this golden age of television than it ever was before. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, I look forward to continuing the journey. That's what I'm all about. Yeah. <laughs> I think we got, we we got an introduction to one of the characters that plays like the Ghost Nation, one of the the head chief mm-hmm. or whatever. I think I believe that's who he is, and he was the one who was like, oh, you know, I'm with uh, I can't remember the name of the company that they call it. Not Delos. It's the it's the name of the company that. Uh, that Charlotte is sending the information to. Yeah, that when he's like when he meets with Logan in, in the beginning to like oh, get right, his right, funding right. or whatever, he's the character with as along with the um, the blonde haired girl. Yeah, was it is she Armistice? Is that her name? I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, so we got introduced to that character, and I think he like he's going to play like a more pivotal role like down the line. Um, I don't think there was anything else. Like, I mean, it was a pretty straightforward episode. I think there was stuff you could like dig into deeper. I pointed some of that out. What I thought. Right. I mean, I'm not saying that. Like, I we do a lot of theorizing on this podcast. Um, well, I mean, what else do you have to go on at this point? Yeah, there's not a lot. Of, there isn't a lot to go on, and I think that like, you know, we might get think- stuff wrong. Yeah, you know? but I mean, that's I half the that's fun part- of it. Yeah, you know? I think that's definitely. <laughs> The fun part of it is the speculation that comes along with it, you know, especially, yeah. you know, nowadays where you can hop on Reddit and read, you know, 30,000 people's crazy rantings about what's going on. And, you know, only a few select people in the world actually know the truth. So, <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, it's, man. Uh, it's kind of cool to be part of that uh, that shared journey through Westworld. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, so I guess that's all we really have to talk about. I mean, we could continue talking about this all night. <laughs> I'm sure there's like so many yeah. things that, that happened even in previous episodes. I did go back and I was like watching um, the first episode with um, with a friend of mine because they'd never seen it before, and that fly thing kind of, like, stuck in my mind. And there's so many points during that episode where, like, in the first episode of the first season, where the flies mm-hmm. kind of, like, fly around, and she, like, smacks against her face, but then there's other times where the flies show up. Um, and so there's, like, there's some cool things there that I think we can talk about yeah. at some point. Um, but, yeah. Replacement theory. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> is that the true weapon? What is the true weapon? We may never know. It is. It's a. Per, it's like. It's like a game though, because it's like a person, place, or thing. Uh-huh. So it's a place, but it's also a weapon. It's a place that's a weapon, and it's like guess <laughs> guess the riddle. <laughs> we know it's a noun. Yeah. Um. 
yeah, so that's the end of the podcast. Um, <laughs> you can mm-hmm. check out our other podcast um, as part of the Next Level Nerd Network. Um, if you want to read off that, if you want to do your spiel. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, www.nextlevelnerd.com. You can find, basically, that's our that's our hub. You can find us on Facebook. You can find the movie podcast at NLN Movies uh, on Twitter. Um, you can find Next Level Nerd on Facebook. You can find uh, YouTube. We just started uploading there. Thank yeah, you. That's Ashley. exciting. That's yeah. exciting. Um, we also, uh, you know, we're all over the place in terms of uh, in terms of uh, podcast locations with Spotify and Stitcher and whatever your whatever your uh, your podcast heart desires. Uh, this week on the uh, movie podcast, which by the time you hear this will be tomorrow, uh, we will be debuting the episode on Slither, the 2006 James Gunn movie. I have never seen that movie. <laughs> I feel well, like, I feel ashamed. <laughs> it, it's currently on Stars. If you want to watch it, uh, uh, this was the this was the first time Mitchell and I both watched it. Uh, um, I'm a big uh, James Gunn fan, yeah, and yeah. this was probably the last uh, the last one on the list of James Gunn movies I haven't seen. Um, you know, even going back to his days at Troma, uh, <laughs> Troma, good and old Troma, <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, Slither. Uh, you know, check out the uh, check out the podcast. Even if you haven't seen the movie, um, it's worth a listen. Uh, but we we definitely go off on a on a ridiculous tangent about Benedict Cumberbatch. So um, <laughs> is he in that movie? No. No. Okay. <laughs> just just a rant. To. Yeah, it's, it's just, just an absolute rant. Um, <laughs> so yeah, we like to ramble on the movie <laughs> podcast. So it's like the half isn't that half of the skills of podcasting? Exactly. <laughs> as long as you can keep your train of thought, right? Yeah. Um <laughs> Yeah, so um there's I'm also there's other stuff you can check me out on. I'm on I'm a co host on the three to one podcast. It's uh three to one lay on. You can find us on Facebook. We also have a website which is three to one lay on at Lisbon dot com i believe that's the that's the podcast hosting it is the podcast hosting but i mean that's like it <laughs> i mean if you're looking for any information it's going to be on facebook right um and that's a podcast find- that's specifically about larping and those episodes are also uploaded to youtube if you want to check them out spotify itunes etc um we're trying to get this podcast sure frosted cereal up on all of those as well we do have one episode on YouTube. Um, I think we actually got a couple things in the works I can't talk about yet. Ooh, mysterious. Yeah. Um, I did like tease that I was going to like say what some of those things were last week. Um, save it. Save it? Save it. Make them tune in the week after. Dang. So it's either going to do it now or it's going to do it um, on Facebook. Uh, The one one thing isn't really that I I think I can tease it, which is we're going to start doing um, Netflix, um, Amazon Prime, um, just like recommendations. Mm. It's like a little maybe like 15, 20 minute little podcast where I just go through, you know, some movies or some TV that we might recommend, mostly TV, because obviously Next Level Nerd is the the movie podcast. But just some little things you can binge over the weekend, new releases, stuff like that to look out for. Um, yeah, just non spoilers, no spoilers. We're just gonna be like, hey, watch this movie, watch this TV show, and that's it. Any kind of like in depth review or anything like that, you're gonna have to wait for uh, Sugar Frosted Cereal podcast <laughs> series on the tv show or if it's a movie you're gonna have to wait for next level nerd to cover it season um, 19 yeah season 19 <laughs> but yeah um so yeah until then or until next week um stay safe internet yeah it's a 
dark world out there or whatever. I'm trying to quote a line from the show and I just can't. Something you know, these, about splendor. These, these violent delights lead to violent ends. There you go. Fade out. 